get out here, you should be praising the Lord because every single night becomes more difficult. Because you have a real enemy that will try and make sure that you cannot make it. Okay? So every single night we ought to thank the Lord for his mercies because he is always good to us. So as is my custom, tonight we have uh, quite a little bit to cover. I'm going to invite you to bow your heads. I'll say a word of prayer and then we'll begin. Father in heaven, we are thankful that firstly you've kept us and you've brought us safe and sound tonight right mind. And we pray, Father, now as we open your word, your blessing would attend the opening of your word. We plead that you would give us hearts that are inclined to hear your voice. And as we hear your voice, Lord, like those that have gone before us, help us to have the same conviction to simply say, here am I, Lord. Send me. Or what would you have me? So we thank you so much. And we pray that your word would not return to you void and have become. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Now I want to begin by showing you a, a picture of a man. Let's see if this thing works. Let's turn it on first. Um, so tonight we're looking at the Antichrist and the cults that follow him. But tomorrow night we're going to look at Revelation's conjoined twins. We're going to what are those? What's that all about? And, and how does it impact us? And does anyone outside of Anna know who this man is? Or who, who this man was? Winston Churchill. Okay. A famous uh, British Prime Minister. He ended up British Prime Minister. Now, Churchill is attributed to saying something that I found very interesting. Churchill said, most people sometime in their life stumble across truth. Most jump up, brush themselves off, and hurry on about their business as if nothing happened. So this is what church you are saying. You know, you're, 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 you're going about life and you stumble into truth. Some people just dust themselves off and just carry on, same old, same old. My prayer is that tonight, please don't be like this. When we hear truth, let's pick it up and embrace it, believe it, and follow it by the grace of God. Now, tonight, we want to decode the confusing counterfeit of the Antichrist. But I want to start by taking you, at least, first of all, to some common beliefs out there, okay? The subject of the Antichrist scares a lot of people. They just hear the word Antichrist, and whether they're religious or not, they're already just shaking. Okay? But the most frightening thing, my friends, would be to miss him altogether. So it's one thing to be afraid of Antichrist, but it's another thing to not even know his identity because then how are you going to know you're not in this snare? So we want to use the Bible to figure out, well, who is the Antichrist? What's that all about? And what does Jesus have to say about that? But I want to begin by taking you on a little trip in history. In the 16th century, as you see there, that is an image that was painted of the Antichrist. This is the 15th century, so it's the 1500s, okay? So as you see that the belief was basically Antichrist is some kind of a demon figure, figure all right? Then, um, in the 19th century, there was a man called uh, Frederick Nietzsche. This man is the one responsible for creating the Superman, whatever, series, legend, whatever you want to call it. Now, Nietzsche actually... Uh, wrote a book, and this book basically determined the Antichrist, uh, translated the Antichrist. So Nietzsche basically was depressed and got to a point where he felt that Christian values have no place in modern society, and they need to be thrown out. Now, he is also responsible for this famous, uh, what later became a famous Time magazine cover, which was is God dead? This was in the 1950s where, when this was out. And even up to today, some preachers are still trying to address the issues that were raised by this. But this goes all the way back to Nietzsche. And simply put, actually, before I go there, Wikipedia, now when I was in school, we were not allowed to use Wikipedia. Okay? We, actually, we would be failed. If, if you just went and took anything from Wikipedia, you'd be in trouble. 
but uh, times have changed. <laughs> now, Wikipedia, this is actually a popular view. This is uh, like a search engine. Wikipedia says the Antichrist, according to Christianity, is one who fulfills biblical prophecies concerning an adversary of Christ while resembling him in a deceptive manner. It continues, it says, the Antichrist will seemingly provide for the needs of the people, but deny the ultimate salvation. It's very interesting. That's Wikipedia. Very interesting. But there are four texts in the Bible that deal with the Antichrist, and, and we'll come to them um, shortly. Now, the best way to avoid the Antichrist, this is the whole point of tonight's presentation, the best way to avoid the Antichrist and the cult that follow him is to know Jesus Christ, the Christ of the Bible. Okay? So remember again, I told you my wife worked in a bank, and the only way you could spot a fake was you needed to know the genuine. That's the principle that, that we, we're going to use. Now, thinking back to our church history, does anyone remember what that white horse in the plagues was representing? Okay, the, the pure church or the victorious church at the beginning. Now, you know, it's interesting because we need to go back to, and I was curious, so what did they believe back in the day about the Antichrist? Now, there is a man called Polycarp who was a disciple of John the Revelator. Very interesting. You know, disciples have disciples. You know, Jesus said, go make disciples. So disciples have disciples. Well, anyway... This is a man that was discipled by John, and, and they found some writings from him. Now, he warned that anyone preaching false doctrine was an antichrist. This is church history, way back. And he, he lived in uh, between 69 and 155 AD, so first century. Okay? This is what he believed. Then, one of uh, the early, sorry, Arrhenius as well, was a contemporary, second century. He wrote, he said that Antichrist is basically Daniel's little horn, and we're going we're gonna to touch on that. And he's also Paul's man of sin, and he's John's beast, or Revelation's beast. This is, again, early church history. This is what they believed back then. Now, one of the early church fathers, he held that the Roman Empire was a restraining force written about by Paul in 2 Thessalonians. We're going to read that soon. The fall of Rome and the transition into the Ten Kingdoms were to make way for the Antichrist. So what we covered on night number one, where we had these four kingdoms, Babylon, Middle Persia, Greece, and Rome, he basically was saying, listen, when pagan Rome or when the imperial Rome goes off the stage, that's when Antichrist will come. And, and this was an early belief. And again, little refresher. Daniel chapter 2, after the fourth kingdom divides, then basically, he said that time period, which you have there on your screen, that's when Antichrist would come. Okay, we have a little wasp up front here. <laughs> uh, don't let it bite Sister Regina. Somebody move it for me. Okay, it's been taken care of. All right. Then we move further on. In the 1400s to the 1600s, a man called Martin Luther, Reformation giant, he wrote, we are convinced that the papacy is the seat of the true and real Antichrist. So it's very interesting that, you know, you had all these beliefs that were there. In fact, Luther continued, you should know that the Pope is the real, true, final Antichrist of whom the entire scripture speaks, whom the Lord is beginning to consume with the spirit of his mouth, and will very soon destroy and slay with the brightness of his coming. Now the question would be, wait a minute, wasn't Luther just a disgruntled church member who left one church, and now he's writing these things? Okay? Well, let's continue with some other people. John Calvin, Daniel, and Paul had predicted that, that Antichrist would sit in the temple of the head of the cursed and abominable kingdom in, in the Western world we affirm to be the Pope. Again, this is very interesting, like strong words. John Calvin. Luther was saying the same thing. Calvin comes is saying the same thing. And all these before are saying the same thing. But the question is, so would the church sit back? How did the church respond to this accusation? Or at least it seems like an accusation. 
Now, early days, there was what was known as a counter-reformation. One of the points of the counter-reformation, so reformation is where you have your Protestant churches rose up, rose up eventually. But the counter-reformation, one of their main goals was to reverse the teaching that the Pope or the Beast or the Antichrist. That's one of their main goals. And also to do some PR work, some public relations, okay? But now, what is interesting in this counter-reformation there was a priest, this priest called uh, Francisco Rivera, and he was a scholar. And he came up with this idea called, or this method called futurism. And what this simply means, what futurism simply teaches, is everything in the book of Revelation from chapter 3 onwards will happen way in the future when Jesus is coming. It has nothing to do with us, has nothing to do with the church. So that was the idea that um, this Spanish Jesuit teacher brought in. Someone will say, wait a minute, but Jesuit, what's one of those? What's that got to do with it? Now, you, you remember that the current Pope, when he was elected, as you see there on Washington Post, he was the first Jesuit Pope. And this is simply a special order that was raised up to accomplish this special work. Now, um, along the way, again, Sorry, just kind of giving a little bit of the history here. Cardinal Bellamino, uh, later on, he systemized the teaching that had been brought in by Francisco Ribeiro. So by systemizing it, basically it became the common theology. Now, why am I burdening you, burdening you with this? This is the summary of what basically what, what the teaching espouses. Number one, the Antichrist would come just before the end of the world. Now, a common belief among Christians. Number two, the Antichrist would be accepted by the Jews, which again also is a common belief among Christianity. Then number three, the Antichrist would be enthroned in the temple in Jerusalem. Again, a common belief. In fact, a Christian friend told me that this is what they truly believe as well. I found interesting. I'm like, oh, okay. um, very interesting. But this is now a common belief, and simply put, Futuristic ideas about the Antichrist, they were starting and then they went underground for about 250 years. But the question is, what Luther was saying, what Calvin was saying, what now the futurist is saying, is that still biblical? We're going to put all of this to the test because we don't want the testimony of what men said. We simply want to know what does the Bible say. So one more character I want to share with you. Uh, in the 19th, 72, in the 16th century, a man called Edward Irving rose up and he had an, int in, an interest in last day prophecy. So he starts studying last day prophecy, he starts studying books, and he translated a very influential book on last day events. Now, this book that he picked up was literally the, one of the books that had been written by a Jesuit uh, priest, another Jesuit priest. And as he translated this, he brought back the ideas of futurism. In fact, he's the founder of what's known as the Catholic Apostolic Church. See, before the, Pente the Pentecostal churches would rise in the 1900s, but about 80 years before that, this man basically was running one. Let me put it that way. And so, in another little interesting historical fact, in 1830, one of his congregational members had a vision and in her vision, the church was raptured before the Antichrist appeared. And Irving included that in the doctrine which went out. And so this is what influenced um, Christianity and what's still influencing Christianity today. Okay? So simply put, Futurism's Antichrist is an individual who shows up at the end. He leads a European confederacy. He rules in Jerusalem for 120 literal days. He betrays Israel. He causes the final battle of Armageddon in Palestine. And he is destroyed at the coming of Christ. That's what many people believe today. But I want you to turn in your Bibles. We want to now consider, okay, as with anything, we have to test it by the Bible. Let's go to Acts chapter 20 and verse 29. I want you to see that Jesus had a burden and the apostles had a burden to prepare us with regard to the Antichrist. So Acts chapter 20.
And I'm going to put it up on your screen as well. Acts chapter 20, verse 29. The Bible says, For I know this, this is the Apostle Paul speaking, that after my departing shall grievous wolf enter in among you the flock. So keep this in mind. Paul was already warning the early church, after I've gone off the scene, grievous wolves are going to enter in among you. But notice from where, verse 30, it says, also of your own selves, speaking perverse things to draw away disciples after them. So when you notice, where is Paul warning of the danger coming from? Okay, outside and inside. Keep this in mind. Paul is saying, listen, there's going to be danger for the followers of Christ. But the danger comes from outside and the danger comes from inside. Okay, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3 continues. So it says, Let no man deceive you by any means, for that day shall not come except they come away what? A falling away first. Or in the Greek there it says an apostasy, a divorcing away from God. And Paul's addressing church members. So saying within the church, the day of Jesus is not coming before there is some kind of apostasy within. Then he says, and that man of sin be revealed the son of perdition, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped, so that, now notice this part, this part is very interesting, so that he as God sits where? In the temple of God, okay? Keep this in mind. He's saying that the son of perdition as God sits in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now, my friends, I, I don't want to scare you anything, but simply put, the Bible is telling us that one of the most, in fact, the most dangerous place on planet Earth is in the church, if you're deceived. Because the Bible is saying there is someone that's going to sit as God in the temple of God. Now, some want to say, well, hang on, but uh, where, where's the temple of God? In fact, we read 2 Thessalonians 2 and, and 4. Notice 1 Corinthians 3.16 to, to understand, well, what is the temple of God? It says, Know ye not that ye are the temple of God, and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you? And he's addressing the church at this point. And so simply put, my friends, the temple of God is also the church, the body. And also, it's also individually, we are temples of God. But the warning from Paul is there would be someone that's going to sit as God in the church. So remember, trouble comes from outside, but trouble comes from within. You see, Satan said, I will be like God. That was his ambition in heaven. Couldn't fulfill those ambitions in heaven. So guess what? Next best place is planet Earth. I will be like God on planet Earth. And then he has to get worship. So simply put, with Paul, with the Apostle Paul, the Antichrist is called the man of sin, the lawless one, and the son of perdition. So, which is a very interesting term. And, and he continues, sorry, let, let me just finish this part. In verse 6, notice what he says, sorry, in verse 5, it says, Remember ye not that when I was yet with you, I told you these things. So clearly there's things that Paul told the believers that he, he educated them on, and now he's trying to remind them. Then verse 6, it says, And now you know that now you know that we withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time. So Paul makes this point that there's something that's withholding or that's stopping the Antichrist from basically being revealed. Or it's not yet time. So simply put, it was being restrained. Antichrist was being restrained in the first century or the son of perdition from basically his time, his appearance. Then it is against God, sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself to be God. Okay. And simply put, my friends, this leads us to think, well, hang on, this cannot be just a man. It has to be some kind of an institution. Because a man does not transcend all those time periods. Then continuing on, it's coming like Satan works with, with signs and lying wonders, and it is the lawless one who is against the law of God. That's a little bit from, from Paul's letters. In fact, um, John, what we read, John describes him as Antichrist. 
Paul describes him as a man of sin or the lawless one. Daniel describes him as the little horn. We're going to look at that shortly. And then John the Revelator describes him also as a beast. But I want you to go to Daniel chapter 7 real quick. Daniel, the seventh chapter. And I'm going to look at a very interesting passage in the book of Daniel. And we're going to summarize it. So in Daniel chapter 7, I want you to see verse 1. Again, remember, God reveals all things to his prophets. In Daniel chapter 7, in verse 1, it says, In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed. Then he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. It's very interesting that God always wants to speak to his people, to show his people things, because my friends, Jesus does not want you to be deceived. Jesus wants you to have a clear picture, and with that clear picture, you can make informed decisions. So Daniel has this dream, and then notice in verse 2, it says, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision by night, and behold, four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. So simply put, the Bible is very clear what Daniel sees. He sees four winds, he sees them striving upon the great sea. And someone will say, well, what do all these symbols mean? And you can write this down if you're writing it down. The sea represents people. Where do we find that? Revelation 17 and verse 15. Then the wind represents war. Where do we find that? Proverbs 1, 27. And then a beast, in the same book of Daniel, Daniel tells us that a beast, or an angel tells Daniel, a beast represents a kingdom. Okay? And you find this in Daniel 7, 17 and Daniel 7, 23. So what Daniel sees, these four beasts that are rising up out of the sea, Daniel is simply seeing these kingdoms that are rising up. But then he says those four beasts came up from the sea, diverse from one another. Then he starts explaining to us, verse 4, the first one was like a lion with eagle's wings. He gives us a description of that. Then he tells us the second one is like a is basically like a bear it's raised up on one side it has three ribs in its mouth then he doesn't stop this so just be thinking wait kingdom one kingdom two then he tells us a third one is like a leopard which has four heads and it has four wings of a fowl of a bird so this is what he's seeing in his dream then daniel gets to the fourth one and the fourth one daniel can't even pick any animal that he can relate it to he just says listen I saw it and it was a dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. That's, that's the only description he can give it. And then he says, and it had great iron teeth, it devoured and break in pieces. He gives more details about this beast, beast number four or kingdom number four. But when we jump to verse 23, the explanation, we are told that the fourth beast shall be what? The fourth kingdom which is diverse for many others. Now, if you've been faithfully coming each night, do you remember anything else that dealt with four kingdoms from the book of Daniel? Four, you know, that, that four kingdoms, and then there's fourth kingdom, there's iron, there's, 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 there's just something about four kingdoms that we may, we may have stumbled into along the way. Okay, the legs of iron, so the image from Daniel chapter 2. And simply put, my friends, God was giving Daniel. Now, remember in Daniel 2, the king had a dream. And God told Daniel, and then Daniel interpreted it. In Daniel chapter 7, God gives the dream now to Daniel, but in different symbols, but still representing the same four kingdoms. So those kingdoms were Babylon, Medo-Persia, Greece, and Rome. And now what is interesting is more information is given with regard to the fourth one. And it says in Daniel 7 and verse 8, I considered, so it had 10 horns on its head. It says, I considered the horns and behold, they came up among them another little horn. So now Daniel mentions this little horn. And he says, listen, and this, this little horn, you know, it plucks up three by the roots and then it has the eyes like the eyes of a man and the mouth, which is speaking great things. Someone is saying, okay, well, what's this whole thing about the eyes like the eyes of a man? 
If, if you ever read Ephesians 1.18, the eyes of man is basically the understanding of man. Or, or it's built on the understanding of man or the wisdom of man. Then, a mouth speaking great things. Interesting enough, John tells us about something that also has a mouth that speaks great things. So let's turn to Revelation 13. Revelation 13. And we are trying to decode... What is going on with all these characters? Revelation, the 13th chapter. I want you to notice with me in verse, verse 1. So remember that in Daniel 7, those animals were a lion, were a bear, were a leopard, and then this dreadful thing that he can't even describe. In Revelation 13 and verse 1, John says, And I stood upon the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea. You see, I love this because John tells you where he's standing. And notice he's not standing in the sea. He says, no, no, I'm standing on the bank. And you know, sometimes when you're, not, when you're not in it, you can see clearly. You can see your vision is clear like, mm, okay, I see something there. But when you're in it, sometimes you're blinded to what's really going on. So John says, I, he sees this beast rising up out of the sea. It has seven heads, ten horns, and upon his horns, ten crowns. And upon his heads, the name of, of blasphemy. Now, that's never a good thing. Whenever you see blasphemy, you should just be like, oh, oh this, this can't be good news for, for anybody concerned. Then he continues in verse 2. Notice now he says, And the beast which I saw was like unto what? A leopard. And his feet were as the feet of what? A bear. And the mouth is the mouth of a lion. Now, very interesting, Daniel, in Daniel 7, saw, he saw a lion, he saw a bear, he saw a leopard, then he saw this dreadful thing. John, looking now, John is looking backwards, Daniel is looking forward, John is looking backwards, and John is saying, hmm, wait a minute, this thing looks like a leopard. Uh, okay, and also it has features of a bear, and then oh, it has the mouth of a lion. So John is looking that direction. So he's, he's counting down from leopard represented Greece, bear represented Medo-Persia, and then lion represented Babylon. Daniel is looking that way where the first thing he's living during the time of Babylon, going to Medo-Persia, going to Greece, and then it's going to end up with Rome. John is living in the time of Rome, so John is looking back and he sees, hmm, this thing looks like it's an amalgamation or it's the fullness of all these other ones before. And then he continues on. In fact, it's like this composite beast. But then he continues, and this is where trouble comes. He says, And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast, and they worship the beast, he's talking about the, the people of the earth, saying who is like unto the beast and who is able to make war with him. Then he tells us that this beast reigns for 42 months. And it's speaking blasphemies and doing all kinds of things. And in verse 5, he says it rains for 42 months. This is the first time we're given a time frame. And God gives all these things so that we're able to know, hmm, okay, I'm looking for this time period, and I'm looking for a kingdom that has a reign for that time period. So in Bible prophecy, again, refresher, we mentioned this another night. A day is equal to, a prophetic day is equal to one, sorry, a literal year, okay? One prophetic day, one literal year. Where do we find that? Numbers 14, 34 and Ezekiel chapter 4 and verse 6, okay? God says, I've given you a day for a year. So now, when we think 42 months, those of you who are good mathematicians with the top of your head, 42, now for the Hebrews, a month is 30 days. Okay, 30 days. The Bible month is 30 days. So you would simply say 42 by 30, 1,260 prophetic days or literal years. Now, do we have a period in history where we had a 1,260-year period where somebody was ruling? And remember, Paul said there was a deterrent and once that deterrent was out of the way, the man or the, this Antichrist would rise. And simply put, friends, 
again, we go back to history, we go to, 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 to our Bible too, we find that from 538 to 1798, there was a time known as the Dark Ages in the world. Or in other words, a time of great apostasy. Or in a language that, you, that you're familiar with, it was the time of the fourth seal that we read about, this, this pale horse. And during this time, state and church shook hands. The state was now the instrument of the church, and the, 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 under state and church, over 100 million people perished for their beliefs under the hands of a church-state union. And this church-state union was simply under what is known as the Roman papal system. So the Roman church, when, in fact, let me go back one slide. When the Roman Empire, when the emperor moved from Rome and went to Turkey, to Constantinople, the Bishop of Rome, or today we'd call it the Pope, basically ascended that seat. He was given the palace. He was given the seat. And basically, he became the ruler of Christendom over time. And so, Revelation 13, the beast in Revelation 13 is simply the same as Daniel's little horn. Now, why is this important? Why do we need to know these things? Daniel 8 warns us that this power would cast truth down to the ground. Now, do you think that's a good thing to cast the truth down to the ground? Of course not, my friends. That is one of the most dangerous things we can do. Now, John chapter 8, 32 says, the truth will do something for us. What will it do? Set us free. So if we took truth and we cast it to the ground... We're taking the only thing that could set us free and cast it to the ground. It means that we would remain in bondage. And friends, tonight I hope that that is not your desire to cast truth to the ground. Because the little horn cast truth to the ground. It had a period where it prospered. In fact, Daniel 7 continues by saying, The little horn shall speak pompous words against the Most High. Pompous words. It would basically speak things that are unheard of. You know, growing up, people would, would say to you, you know, don't say those things with your mouth because that's the same mouth you kiss your mother with. And so, so think of it that way, that the same mouth that was created by God should not speak pompous words against God. Should not be. In fact, it also tells us that it shall persecute the saints of the Most High and it shall intend or it shall think to change times and laws. So think of a religious power thinking to change times and laws which belong to God. That is troublesome. Because if you want to change something that God put, you're simply saying that basically I'm wiser than God and I am God. That's basically what, what's going on. So for centuries... Honest people have been deceived by the Antichrist, and the same vulnerability exists even today. The same thing. It's happened before, it happens today. So many sincere people end up in wrong places, such as cults. It's not a new thing. It's happened in the past, it's happening today, and it will continue to happen unless people know the truth. And simply put, cults are strange or dangerous religious groups. That's how you can, you can describe cults. And if you go to John 17 now, something very interesting. Remember, Paul describes the Antichrist as the son of perdition. This is a title that is applied to Judas by Jesus, the son of perdition. So John 17, I want you to notice verse 12. It says, while I was with them in the world, I kept them in my name. Those that thou gavest me I have kept, and none of them is lost, but the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. Now let me ask you an obvious question. Was Judas a religious man? Yes. Judas was in the church. Judas was one of the church leaders, and yet Judas is the one the Bible ascribes as the son of perdition. So to look for Antichrist outside of the church would be a big, big mistake, my friends. Because Judas was right there in the church. In fact, Judas was even the treasurer of the church. Did you know that? So friends, you know, many people will say, well, you know, church is church. I just go to church, any church. But the Bible says, no, 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 no. 
we need to be careful. We need to understand that church is not just church. Because the Bible says, Antichrist or the son of perdition will sit as God in the temple of God, claiming to be God. And so now, when we go to our churches, we need to be extra vigilant to make sure, listen, is, is this Antichrist speaking or, or is this the pure word from God? And this is why we need this always with us. And we need to test all things. So Judas was a type of Antichrist. You see, when you looked at Judas, Judas looked like he was part of the system. Judas looked like he was for the faith. Judas, everything he did seemed as though he is prospering the work of the gospel. And Judas was sincere to begin with. But simply put, my friends, Jesus betrayed Jesus with a kiss. Something that looked like he was honoring him was actually bringing him down. In fact, it's very interesting that human nature is clearly shown with Judas. You see, many of us will say, if God says this and it goes against what I've believed all my life, I'm not sure about it. Well, guess what? Judas thought he was smarter than God. Judas thought that the way God was doing things needed improvement. It needed a little change to it. In fact, many will think, well, you know, it must mean that it's for someone else or it's for other people or it must not be for me. And simply put, the question, my friends, is are we going to follow how we feel or are we going to follow what God says? That's the crux of the matter. You see, Judas liked being in Jesus' company Judas liked what Jesus was doing, but Jesus, Judas was thinking, well, Jesus is taking a little bit more time to go to the throne, so let me help him get to the throne. Let me speed things up. Judas thought to change God's will. And that is always a dangerous thing, my friends. That is a recipe for Antichrist. In fact, again, the best way to avoid Antichrist and the cults that follow him is to know Jesus Christ the Christ of the Bible. Notice what God says. Look unto me, Isaiah 45, 22. Look unto me and be what? Be ye saved. Notice he's not saying look unto man. God says look unto me and be ye saved. All the ends of the earth for I am God and there's none else. This is what the God of the Bible says. So how can people seeking God avoid getting in a cult? Funny story I'll share with you. I have a friend of mine. His name is Ivan. Ivan decided one time he had been raised in a nice Christian home. I don't know what happened, but he decided one day he wanted to become a Satanist. So he's telling me this story and I was just amazed. He ended up going to some meeting, some Satanist. I don't even know how he found it. Anyway, he went to this meeting. As he comes to this meeting, they actually have an orientation. You know, you, you can ask some questions and things like that. So my friend Ivan, he's a little bit out of the box. He decides to ask one question. He asks the question, so, you know, if I decide I wanted to leave, can I do that? And he says, the person there, the leader said, no, you can't do that. And he said, well, what do you mean I can't do that? You, you just told me the only commandment we have is do as you want. And so if I wanted to leave, can I leave? They said, no, no, no. Once you're in, you're in. You cannot leave. And he said he started arguing with this person. And in the end, he's like, well, then I'm not going to be a member of this because clearly you're telling me I can do what I want, but then I can't really do what I want. But I, I was thankful when he told me that story. I said, praise the Lord that he was crazy enough to ask that question. Because if he hadn't asked that question and joined, he'd have been stuck in this satanic cult. But through that, the Holy Spirit spared him and, and he got his life in order. I'm, I'm glad to tell you that he's, he loves the Lord and he's serving the Lord faithfully. But how can we avoid ending up in cults or people that are genuinely seeking the Lord? Right. First point, we're going to cover five points. Cults have a self-proclaimed Messiah, typically. In fact, Jesus warned us in Matthew 24, 24, for false Christs and false prophets will rise, to deceive, if possible, who? Even the elect. So not just any old person down there. No, no, no. It's saying that the target is the very elect. If possible, 
they would be deceived. Now, you know, there's a difference between deception and rebellion. Deception is simply, I didn't know, I made the decision not knowing, and I found myself in that place. Rebellion, on the other hand, is I knew, but I don't care. I'm still going to go. So that's the difference between those two things. And Jesus is warning about deception. In fact, if you, if you um, probably like a month or two ago, we went to, my wife and I, we went to the country of the Philippines. And in the country of Philippines, there's this famous pastor. The day I landed, this was what was on the news. Uh, pastor Quil Boloy, he, Apollo Quil Boloy had been arrested. In fact, this is a pastor that claims to be the son of God. Like literally. And he has many followers. In fact, this is when the FBI were looking for him. And uh, some of the things there he was wanted for was conspiracy to engage in sex trafficking by force and trafficking children and all kinds of things. And this was a man claiming to be the son of God, claims to be Jesus, claims to, and he has thousands of followers. And you ask yourself, how do those followers end up following in that situation? In fact, many of them were in tears and many of them were, they were worried that they were going to fight the police when the police came. They worried that they were, they were armed. There was a compound and, and they thought things are going to go bad. But again, many people and some sincere people following. Okay, And some of you remember back in the day, 1995, there was a man called Marshall Applewhite. And Marshall Applewhite basically had a very interesting doctrine where he believed that this comet that was coming was basically aliens that were coming to rescue the redeemed. And, uh, and, and, and we'll cover that shortly. Also, in history, there's also been Jim Jones, who led uh, many people. In fact, Jim Jones was, was regarded highly even by some, uh, there's a vice president, I believe, who spoke well of him. And, and they, they upheld him as a good model citizen. And unfortunately, it was nothing but a cult, and many people lost their lives as a result. But you notice in Revelation 17, Speaking of the direction the world is going, it talks about a time where a group, these have one mind, speaking of the beasts of the world or the kingdoms of the world, they have one mind and shall give their power and strength unto the beast. And simply put, friends, the world is becoming more and more cultish. One leader that tells it what to do and an inability to think for yourself. In fact, the Bible says, Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is none other name under heaven given among men, whereby we must be saved. Simple point to this. There are no substitutes, is what the Bible is saying. There's only counterfeits. So there is no Christ 2.0, Christ 3.0, or another little imitation version. No, no, no. The Bible says there's only one way. And that's the only way. There are no substitutes, just counterfeits. Another interesting thing about cults, the cult leader's words are above the Bible. Now, friends, it is a dangerous, dangerous thing whenever we start trusting the words of a man or the words of a woman above the Bible. When we do that, you might as well just sign up and say, I am a member of a cult. When we put any man or any woman's words above the plain teachings of the Bible. In fact, notice this. The Bible says it itself. It says, to the law and to the testimony, Isaiah 8.20, if they speak not according to what? This word, God's word, it is because there is lacking a little light. No, no, no. It says there is no light. Absolutely no light. Does not matter your position. You may be the leader of the biggest church in the world. You may be not a leader. Simply put, if it goes against the Bible, the Bible is saying there's no light in that. And when you see that happening, my friends, flee. Flee for your life. In fact, Revelation 18 verse 23 says, For by thy sorcery, speaking of mystery Babylon, all nations were deceived. So friends, I want you to notice the big problem. In the church, deception. In the world, deception. Deception, deception, deception. In fact, if deception were stocks on a stock market, I would be telling you, go, go buy deception. Because that's a stock that's just going to keep rising. You're never going to have to worry about it falling. Okay? But 
deception is a reality. In fact, Jesus in Mark 7, 7 addresses this very point, speaking of the Jews. He says, in vain do they do what? Worship me. So notice the problem was not a lack of worship. The problem was vain worship. Now, what made it vain, my friends? He says, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. So before God, something becomes vain worship when the word of God is put down here and the word of man is put up here. That becomes a, a big issue. And so we need to be very, very careful that we're not worshiping our own, following our own ideas or following the ideas of people that we, we look up to. So Marshall Applewhite, he taught that this comet was basically going to usher in the end, the end of the world. And simply put, many people perished under this teaching because he told them we need to prepare, we're going to board this comet. And in order to board it, you're supposed to take your own life. And in fact, the records say many people were dressed in beautiful suits, beautiful dresses, and they went out into these jungles preparing to board this thing and took their own lives because they trusted in the words of one man above the word of God. Friends, we are not immune from this. We need to test all things always by the word of God. And as I said to you before, test your preacher by your Bible, not your Bible by your preacher. And I'm not immune from that. Test me by the word of God and the word of God alone. In fact, John 8.32 says, And you shall know the truth, and the truth shall do what? Set you free. Which means if truth sets you free, the opposite is true. Error will keep you in bondage. This is why error is so deadly. So friends, simply put, if any religious leader puts himself in the place of God, distorts biblical principles, makes up their own rules, basically, that is a big red flag. Big red flag. We ought to respect our religious leaders, but if they say anything that's contrary to the Bible, we need to say thanks, but no thanks, and be gone. Third point about cults. Cults will coerce their followers into submission. Cults will use force, will use intimidation, will use all things. Does the Bible show us this? Revelation chapter 13, verse 16. It says, and he causes all, both small and great, interesting enough, speaking about the, uh, the beast or, or the beast, the second beast in Revelation, rich and poor, free and bond, and we'll cover this one another night, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. So notice it causes it compels, but notice the reason why, verse 17, in that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark. So that's where you have coercion now. Take this mark, without this mark, you cannot buy or sell. Coercion. That's cultic behavior. And the Bible says this whole world is going to turn into one big cult. And the challenge for us is we don't want to be a part of any cult. We want to be followers of Jesus. In fact, the fourth point, cult leaders appeal to miracles as a sign of their authority. How many of you have ever said, Lord, I need a miracle? <laughs> okay, I'm not trying to frighten you with that. I've, I've said it too. There are times where we need a miracle, but your relationship with Jesus should not be based on miracles. Let's go to Revelation 16 to, to, to see this point. Because if all we do is just base it on miracles, friends, we are in big, big trouble. Revelation chapter 16, I want you to see something interesting in verse, um, verse 14. After it speaks about unclean spirits in verse 13, verse 14, the first part says, For they are spirits of devils doing what? Working miracles. Your Bible, my Bible, the Bible says that spirits of devils can work miracles. So miracles are not the standard to say this is of God or not. Test it by the word of God. In fact, the Apostle Paul tells us, For no wonder, 
For Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light. See, friends, Satan appeals to our senses. He uses our senses, our feelings to draw us in because he knows he can overload us with that. And so it is never safe to base anything on our feelings, our sight, and all these things. And it continues in 2 Corinthians chapter 11. It says, Therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also transform themselves into ministers of righteousness. So there's this switch that it's warning, and Paul is warning Christians or the church. So in Revelation 13, 13, speaking of the second beast, it says he performs, notice what he performs, great signs. So again, miracles are not a safe guide to base something on, to base your relationship with God on. And Revelation 16, we already read that, there are spirits of demons performing signs and wonders. So even if it is sincere, we're still to test it. Is that clear? Then, the last point, point number five, cults urge group conformity. Group conformity. So basically, you cannot be an individual in terms of individual thoughts, in terms of how you do things. And notice what the Bible says to this. The Bible says, so then each of us shall do what? Give account of himself to who? To God. Now simply put, my friends, what this means is, even this is individual accountability. So even if today Pastor Ismail takes one position, you cannot stand before God and say, well, Pastor Ismail said this, so I, I, you know, I did it because of Pastor Ismail. God says, I gave you a brain. In fact, I heard one preacher say anytime he did something wrong in school and came back and he'll say to his mother, but mom, the other kids did this. And, and the mother would say, was your brain lacking today? And she says, you have your own brain. And so my friends, you find that even if my wife's decisions, my wife will be accountable for her decisions. My decisions, I'll be accountable for. My pastor's decisions, he's accountable for. And friends, the same thing, there is no salvation by church or by group. It is individual. We stand before God and we are answerable before God. Cults will say, no, 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 it's a group thing. Once you're in this group, then you're, it's all good. But no, 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 my friends, we cannot base anything that we do on, well, my, my, wife, my wife hasn't decided, my husband hasn't decided, so I'm not going to decide. No, 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 God says, I'm talking to you. And so 1 John 4 verse 1 says, Beloved, do not believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are of God. So I want you to notice God invites us to check it out. God invites us to test, because truth has nothing to be ashamed of. In fact, God says, come now, let us reason together. So God says, when it's truth, you can search it out, you can ask questions, you can dig into it, but when you now know it is truth, I'll hold you accountable for it. In fact, friends, you all know that God is a God that loves variety. The fact that you exist is evidence that God loves variety. You look at these butterflies, there's so many different types, so many different varieties. You look at human beings, there's so many different people that think differently and do things differently. And God does not say, I want you all to be the same. God simply says, I want you to follow me. I want you. I don't want just some robots or anything like that. So conformity, now conformity says this. Conformity says basically, my job says, my family says, my tradition says, or oh, I've been doing this for 40 years. No, no, no. God says, I'm asking you to follow me. That's what God says. God says, yes, 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 your job is there, your family is there, all these are there. God says, I'm asking you not to look at your problems, but to look at me. And will you follow me? That's all God is asking. And simply put, how much do we need to trust him? To just simply trust him. To simply say, I'm not going to go by sight, I will go by faith. That's what God is asking. When we meet truth, God says, take it by faith. Don't take it by all oh, my tradition, my this, my this. God says, what will you choose? In fact, you become vulnerable to cult deceptions when you look to human authority 
rather than Christ. So if we're, we find ourselves in any of this, friends, we are in trouble. And also we become vulnerable when we accept the teachings of tradition rather than the teachings of the Word of God. And also when we are dependent on miracles and also when we fail to live by our personal convictions. So as God brings conviction upon our hearts, God is simply saying, my friends, I need you to follow me. Don't follow the cults. Don't follow the Antichrist. God is saying, I need you to follow me. I am the way, the truth, and the life. Jesus says, truth will set you free. He says, I will set you free. The big problem for those that do not know truth, friends, the Bible lays it out plain. The biggest problem, the Apostle Paul writes in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 10, he says, and with all unrighteousness, deception among those who perish, notice the reason why, because they did not receive the love of the truth. So it's not that truth was not available, it was simply a love of the truth. So like Churchill said, many people at some point will stumble across the truth, but they'll dust themselves up, carry on as if nothing had ever happened. And he says, and for this reason, God will send them a strong delusion that they should believe a lie. You see, friends, when we choose not to, to love truth, we end up forcing God's hand where God has to simply honor our choice that we would rather believe a lie. And it breaks God's heart to let anyone go that direction. But God is a gentleman. God will not force himself upon anyone. God will respect what people want. So again, Jesus says, you shall know the truth and the truth shall set you free. And friends, our prayer should simply be, in fact, the choice that we now need to make is God's word or tradition. God's word or denomination. God's word or family history. God's word or preachers or authors or teachers or God's word or my feelings. The decision is yours. God would rather you stand on his word because his word will never fail you. Denominations will fail. Traditions will fail. Authors, teachers, preachers will fail. All these things will fail, but God says, I need you to choose. And only you can choose. I cannot choose for you. I can only choose for me. And you can only choose for you. So simply put, there's this interesting little, uh, little poem. It says, what says the Bible, the blessed Bible to me? The teachings of men so often mislead me. What says the Bible, the blessed Bible to me? This my only question be, what says the Bible, the blessed Bible to me? Friends, this should be our prayer and our desire. What says the Bible? Someone comes with any doctrine, what says the Bible? Husband and wife comes with something, what says the Bible? In fact, Jesus put it this way, the words that I speak, they are spirit and they are life. A rejection of this is a rejection of life. It's a rejection of the spirit. I want to share with you the dangers of rejecting truth as I, as I close this. I was in a country called India. Um, as you can see, I keep sharing stories from India. It was one of my, my favorite experiences. And in India, we met this little boy here. His name is Nagendra, as you see on the screen. Now, Nagendra, when he was born, his mother had been persuaded by one of these, you know, every village has these healers or people that, that are there. And this person had told this mother, she was a very superstitious woman. She had been told if she bathes that child, that child basically will perish. So this woman did not bathe this baby for months. She did not bathe him when he was born. Now, by the time we met him, his story was a story of sickness. In fact, when we saw him, this little boy looked like he was about to die. He, his eyes were just a mess, and then he had all these sores on his head. And as we asked the mom, the mom simply told us this story and said, since that time, he's always been a sick child. But 
keep in mind, she listened to the voice of another person. And she went with it. So as we met this little boy, we started uh, trying to help. We, we had a group of medical missionaries. We, we had some people that were translating. And we, we went, we checked him out, we saw him, and then we started going back every single day and basically helping to clean this child and doing some natural remedies on this child. Now, what was interesting is, as we were speaking to them, we were trying to persuade the parents that what we had was basically true and would help the boy. And at first, the father was so resistant, he literally was, was just pushing us away. He was resistant. But as we kept coming, as we kept going, what was interesting now was in one experience, we wanted him to drink some charcoal. Now, yeah, and, and the reaction you had there, that's the reaction the dad had as well, right? So the father was like, over my dead body, my child is not going to drink charcoal. Because to them, charcoal is dirt. So there's no way my child is going to drink dirt. Now, what was funny enough, this lady on your screen, her name is Samantha. Samantha, you know, with all the back and forth, she, she, she saw that there's a problem. So Samantha said, give me that cup with the charcoal. And she took it. And right in front of the man, Samantha drank it. And the man looked at her. The man looked at us and the man said, if it's good enough for an American, it's good enough for my son. He grabbed the cup, put it in his hand, and he told the boy, drink it. And the boy drank. And since then, the dad would allow us to do whatever we needed to do. Now, friends, the little boy recovered. And of course, we were praying a lot for this child. The boy recovered. The whole village knew this story. The, the village was so excited. But what was interesting was it began with the mom had heard a lie. She believed a lie. She was deceived. Then when truth came, the breakthrough for that father was if it is good enough for what someone that he highly esteemed, an American, then it was good enough for his son. But friends, what I'm saying to you tonight is if this was good enough for Jesus, we should be saying it's good enough for me. You see, too often we're like, no, 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 we would rather hold on to the lie of tradition. We'd rather hold on to the lie of, well, well, you know, my feelings and I've been doing this for so long. But simply put, Jesus is saying, listen, when truth comes your way, I need you to simply say, if it was good enough for Jesus, it's good enough for me. And look where Jesus is, my friends. He's in heaven, on his throne. And he says, you just follow me, hold my hand, and I will bring you where I am. So my friends, my appeal is simple. The truth shall make you free. The best way to avoid the Antichrist and the calls that follow him is to know Jesus Christ and the Christ of the Bible. And Jesus is simply saying, my friends, will you put my word above anything else that is happening with you? Will you put my word above your church, above your preachers, above your tradition, above every single thing that you do? Will you do that? I'm going to invite my friend Anna to come up. You have some response cards with you there. And on your response card, I simply want you, as you see there, box number one, if you're saying, okay, it made sense, I got it, put an X in box number one. And then also the other response is there. Now, Anna is going to sing for us. Friends, amen. The question is, are you sure that your anchor is gripping the solid rock? And maybe tonight there's a soul that's simply saying, I realize that maybe I'm on a slippery slope. I'm vulnerable to following cults. I'm standing on the traditions or the teachings or the whatever it may be of others. But tonight I'm simply saying I want to make a commitment to follow wherever this leads me. And if, and, and if that's you tonight, then I'm going to ask you to stand with me where you're simply saying, I want this to be my anchor. And as you do that, I'm also going to put a challenge for you. I'm going to ask you tonight to be praying for tomorrow night and the night after that because we're going to be going into deep waters from here on.
And so you're simply saying, I recognize I may be in danger. And I want to stand upon this. Putting this first above my family, my traditions, my whatever else may come. And if that is you tonight, I'm going to ask you to stand. This is a specific appeal. You want to stand upon the anchor of God's word and to make sure that you are very sure where you're standing. Amen. Friends, there's no time like now to have a sure anchor. Amen. I'm going to invite the rest of you to stand, and we're going to pray. Father in heaven, we thank you because, Lord, you are not content to see your people deceived in the time that we're living. You've given us your sure word, and as the song was sung, Lord, we in times like this, we need an anchor. And that anchor is in the form of the Word of God. And Father, we pray tonight, as you've seen those that are saying, Okay, Lord, I realize I might be in danger and I need to take a decided stand upon your Word. We pray for a special measure of grace upon each one. That each would be able, as they stumble across truth, the truth and nothing but the truth give each the courage to be able to take their stand and say, I will stand with Jesus. If it was good enough for Jesus, it is good enough for us. We thank you for the love you've shown us. We thank you, Lord, that you do not want us to follow the Antichrist or the cults that follow him. But you want us to follow the Lamb of God. To follow our priest, the one who has laid down his life for us. Remind us daily, Lord, and whenever you find us straying from this path, I pray, Lord, that you will trouble us to no end until we have come back under your wing. So please, Father, grant us your spirit. Grant us your leading, your courage, and your faithfulness. So we thank you and we ask these mercies in Jesus' precious name. And please bring us back safely tomorrow, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 Thank you, everyone. As you go out, please uh, give the response cards to my brother, Victor, right at the back. And if you have questions, please put it on your card. Thank you so much for being with us tonight.